there, we're going to try and play a bunch of audio files. Parchman Prison is a prison in Mississippi that um, there were sort of two reasons we wanted to look at it together with you guys, and by no means, like, Tristan and I were each going to present some stuff, but neither of us are <laughs> in any way experts on Parchman Prison, even, you know, like, or comp, but just to think about some of the legacies of the current contemporary incarceration system and the spaces it has come out of and sort of where it's been and where. And so in the case of Parchman, um, and we can look at the, some, some of these pieces too can provide like some more context if you end up being interested and want to read them. The p two pieces are also reflective of the two ways we were trying to look at it. The one is an ACLU piece from a, a case that they filed in 1998, um, and it's sort of a two-pronged case, first around uh, the isolation of HIV positive prisoner, the segregation into a separate unit of HIV positive prisoners, um, which they uh, eventually won and got the prison integrated. Um, there was clearly, this was the case in many prisons through the 90s, but in Alabama and Mississippi, these were like sort of the two last remaining like complete isolation units for HIV positive prisoners and the conditions in them were notoriously squalid, no one was getting their medications, etc. And then out of that there also came a case on death row conditions. Um, and But Parchment itself is um, a, a totally a backlash um, a representation in terms of like the Reconstruction era and these moments of greater civil liberty access for the African American community post slavery that were met by tremendous resistance. And it's like a good one to look at as a window of what is the connection between um, the making illegal of slavery and the sudden total punch in the population, like climb, immediate climb of the number of black persons serving time in the penitentiary system. And so um, in this case, Parchman was called Parchman Farm. It was a cotton plantation that was worked entirely by black slaves and then became a cotton plant, working cotton plantation that was a prison. Um, and it still, it, in the early years, even had only one barbed wire thing that was distinguishing it from the other cotton plantations that were on its every side and had a, a long legacy of brutality and like was even sort of um, touted uh, as it was as to run under exactly that system that it had previously, and so like the warden would be like an overlord, much like etc. So um, hopefully, like some of the things we can bring up is kind of looking at that trajectory. Um, it's one Angola would be another one that people would bring up in a similar sort of fashion. Like what is what do we miss if we fail to talk about, not just about how it's primarily people in poverty who are in prisons, but like to look really at the racial trajectory and the racial dynamic of like who's serving time and for how long and under what conditions. And particularly in some of these, I mean, not only particularly, but like you can look at the initiation of these black codes, quote unquote, that were these legal rubric immediately following the Civil War that suddenly criminalized all these different behavior um, that people, the only people being charged with these vagrancy laws were consistently people of color um, and that you have a moment in which previously um, prisons that were primarily white populations are suddenly within a 10 year period overwhelmingly black populations serving. So what is, um, and someone like Angela Davis speaks about this stuff very eloquently, you know, and like, and talking about uh, the need to look at that legacy. Um, but then what Tristan's going to talk some stuff about and what the second article is on is um, uh, the musical legacy of Parchment Prison. And also there's like a tremendous strain of like blues music that has come out of there and a whole bunch of songwriting and super innovate. So thinking also not only about oppression, but like modes of resistance. And like, so this was the, a sort of, also a moment to kind of see what people have nonetheless created within these incredibly constrictive and oppressive systems. Kind of. So I don't know, would you say some stuff about that and then we can go back yeah, in? Yeah, sure. A... Um, I mean, this just came to my attention when Emily was looking for ideas for um, things that we could talk about on this day, and um, 
I, I'm, I'm primarily interested in music, and I wanted to think of what kind of connection could be made, and she brought my attention to um, the Parchment Farm, and um, through that, I, I found out that Alan Lomax, who was, um, a, I, he was a folklorist and an ethnomusicologist, um, he was the son of this guy, John Lomax, who um, started a lot of sort of um, folklore heritage uh, institutions in the early 1900s. He um, he's most he's most famous, I guess, for bringing uh, this these types of music, these folk musics, into a more popular context. He was um, the first person to like book rock and roll at Carnegie Hall, or to um, bring someone like Doc Reese or the Reverend Gary Davis to the Newport Folk Festival, where um, other audiences were able to see these types of music. Um, he. I think he was like 17 or so when um, he was he was in college, but the depression hit and he had to drop out. And his mother had died, so he decided to go along with his father on these field recording um, expeditions. And he came across with his father. He went to Parchman Prison and recorded um, the work songs of the incarcerated people. Um, there was two separate sessions. There was one in like 1947 and one in 1948. Um, he can, you know, he conducted interviews with these people, um, and most importantly, sort of documented this music that, in some ways, was beginning to be lost because um, of the changing in the ways that, like, farming was being done outside, in, in like, sort of the more capitalist or market environment. People were no longer um, working in groups as much. There was more like single sharecropping. Um, but, uh, let's see, sorry, I'm... Mm. It seems like those songs, so there's like, they're, um, they're group songs always, they're always part of mandatory labor, so, um, they are either while they're chopping trees or like hoeing, you can hear in the recordings in the back actually all of those things happening simultaneously on the kind of beat and on the offbeat. Um, and uh, some of the most complicated ones, like it's, uh, are these ones where four ax persons would be chopping at the same tree, which is uh, in terms of syncopation, totally big, like, you know, you have to be really skillful <laughs> and like careful. And so the way it works is that two people are chopping from one, putting in a chop from one side, like opposite sides, sorry to explain that, like on the right and left, and then on the opposite beat, like so then they're swinging and from the other two opposite sides. So you're literally hitting the tree from all mm -hmm. four sides in and around. And the song is in this sense also a safety measure, right? Because you know how you're trying to sink your swing to not be coming any chance of contact with the axe blade or with like your partner axers, right? Um, and so the use um, that leads to these like uh, unbelievable and incredibly complex rhythmic landscapes, but also that are trying to perform other acts simultaneously. Um, there was definitely, it seems, and this might, um, that from the part of the prison administration, this effort to always, I mean, basically to run people into the ground, <laughs> um, and people did, you know, really die all the time there of just being worked to death, basically, but that they also would try to make the leader, um, and this I'm saying from the administration, the fastest worker, and so if you think of that in terms of like factory and labor, a, lot, a similar kind of thing like the act of the speed up, right? Mm -hmm. But that the song also can set pace, and so it resists the speed up in a certain fashion too, in that like you suddenly have a sync that like you're all agreeing mm -hmm. to work to, um, and so that you insist that the sync is the pace at which you work, um, and it it's a way to non-verbally resist the uh, gesture that like you have to follow what the administration, you know, the like first person. So I think like a lot of compelling things come out of the way in which those songs are used to try and contest certain ways in which. Um, there's a beautiful part of that. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated thing what Alan Lomax is as an archivist, and some of that is very much present 